We are on the campaign trail, uh, catching up now with Keen Umber, who is the Libertarian candidate for governor in Kansas. We have uh, caught him on campus of uh, Kansas State University. So, uh, uh, Keen, let's uh, first to talk. Uh, how's the campaign been going? It's been going fantastic. We couldn't ask for any any greater response from our team, from our the voters, from people we're talking to. Uh, the state fair was a great thing for us. Everybody is so in tune with what uh, is c wrong with Kansas, what's wrong in Kansas politics right now, and it's the governor's income tax plan. There's one overreaching uh, issue that crosses all uh, political lines. It's a Kansas uh, income tax law. It allows 191,000 of us to pay zero income tax, while the 1.4 million wage earners pay all of it. That issue will define this race. Let's talk about more of that in just a little bit, but uh, uh, as we talk, I mean, here you are on the ballot in November uh, for governor, and uh, many folks may know you're an attorney, as the other candidates that are running are as well, but uh, your story is a little bit different, and so uh, you didn't kind of grow up in a family that uh, you always wanted to be a lawyer, but it was, it was actions by the government that kind of uh, started this, this passion, if you will. Well, it was. Uh, we were in the trash business for 18 years in Wabunsee County, and we had a contract with the county commissioners, a franchise contract, to pick up the trash in the county. And I began writing articles and, and had a, a weekly newspaper column that criticized the county commissioners. And uh, they grew very weary of it and actually terminated the contract because of the articles I'd written. We filed a First Amendment lawsuit that went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, where we won 7-2, um, enshrining the, the principle that independent contractors working for the government do have First Amendment rights. It's kind of underwhelming when you think about it, like the sun's going to rise in the east, but because doesn't everybody know that? But apparently not. And it was that five and a half year battle that I, I was, I loved every minute of it. Now, Mrs. Umber uh, didn't love every minute, but I really did. And um, when it was over, I, I was, we, we were hauling trash just like we did before, but uh, it, it wasn't as much fun. I didn't, I didn't have any passion for it. And so I convinced my wife that, hey, let's start selling off some of these businesses that we own and, and I'll go to college with my kids. And uh, my son Josh started college. Uh, and so I thought, what a perfect time. Age 40, let's go to college with the kids. And so we did. I earned a political science degree here at K-State and then uh, on to Washburn Law School where I I earned a law degree in 2005 and passed the bar in September 2005, and, and I've been a lawyer about nine years now, and I love every day of it. Big part of your platform is the income tax situation in Kansas. Uh, really kind of got you motivated to say there is a better way to get out of the situation that Kansas is in. Absolutely. That, that is the defining issue in this, in this gubernatorial race. You know, before we talk about uh, anything else, school finance, RPS, government accountability, we've got to get this money thing straight. And our Kansas income tax plan, Governor Brownback's plan, uh, allowed 191,000 of us that run our own business. We get to pay zero income taxes on our wages and profit. But the wage earner, the 1.4 million wage earners in Kansas, have to continue paying income tax on their wages. That is not fair by any metrics of calculation. And our plan is, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, the 14th Amendment requires everyone has to be treated equally under the law all the time. And this law obviously doesn't. So our plan is equalize the Kansas income tax for all citizens by giving everybody a zero income tax rate. And to do that, the vehicle to do that is a House Bill 2625. It's called the Kansas Fair Tax Bill. It repeals the income tax for everybody, corporate tax, sales tax, financial institution tax, and a few other taxes, and in its place imposes a 5.7% consumption tax on all goods and services. We believe it will produce roughly $3 billion a year. It will be a half billion dollars more than we take in an income tax, so it's going to more than surpass what we give up. But it will be fair. It will be fair to every person that works in Kansas. It will be fair to every person that runs a business in Kansas. And it has to be done in one legislative session. The governor gave it to all his business owners in one legislative session. It has to be given to the wage earner in one legislative session. Now, let's be real here. I'm a realist, uh, an objection of us really, but a realist. And I'm elected governor January 12, 2015. The legislature's not going to say, oh, Umber, you are so right. We were so misguided when we passed this brownback tax plan. Sure, we're going to pass the Kansas fair tax. They're not going to do that. I have no illusions that they're going to do that. So it's, it's time to, to, to put your principles uh, where they're at risk.
I cannot allow 1.4 million people to become the tax slaves of the Kansas legislature. So my, my message to the legislature at the State of the State address is you fix this income tax law first. First bill out of the box. You put that on my desk and I'll sign it. But if you want to delay, if you want to put other bills in front of that, I will veto every bill until you fix this income tax law first. Yes, it's hardball. Yes, uh, it may jam up the legislative process, but there's no other issue of greater importance to people of Kansas than this. Fix this income tax first, no exceptions. We're talking with the key number, who is the Libertarian candidate for governor in the uh, state of Kansas. Well, as uh, you talk to folks and probably uh, talk with your competitors in either debates or discussions, uh, um, sounds like you're a, a one-issue uh, candidate. Is, is that create, uh, does that create issues, or do you have other, uh, other opinions of things? Oh, I'm a lawyer, you know. I have lots of opinions. You have four lawyers in the room, you got five opinions. So, uh, yeah, there are other issues. School finance is a big one. And uh, the renewable portfolio standards, another big one. Kansas water out in western Kansas, our ag economy, another big one. Our Kansas economy as a whole, huge issue. You know, government accountability and transparency, another big issue. Yeah, all those are, you know, you still so work with your, your top one, and then uh, these are ones that come. I have about five second tier issues. Uh, we got to fix the income tax first. We have a horrible budget problem that, that's uh, it's known now. It'll be very pronounced in January of 2015. The government takes over. We'll have to take some drastic measures uh, to get us through the FY15. But uh, you know, the, the second big issue is if the governor has one overriding constitutional responsibility: it's to fairly fund education. Now, how do we do that in all 105 counties or all 286 school districts? And you've heard Governor Brown back and, and Mr. Davis argue back and forth whether he's raised it or lowered it or added money or, or biggest cuts. You know, really, it doesn't make any difference what number we put in there. Currently, we make uh, the base state aid is around $4,400. If we increase it to 5000 everybody would be happy, but that's not the issue. The issue is it's the local school boards makes that decision on how much money is going to be put into teacher salaries and how much money is going to be put in, in the classrooms. And we cannot take that local control away from them. And I don't believe it's fair to, you know, rob from Peter to pay Paul take out of Johnson County and the other counties have done very well for themselves and try to spread it out across all the other 285 school districts under some equalization. Those school board members in all 286 school districts make that decision whether they're going to increase taxes in their district or not. And we have to demand some efficiencies. We don't just keep dumping buckets of money onto education without expecting them to show us where you're being efficient with our money. Uh, because we're enabling certain districts to be inefficient. There are some school districts that get to a point where due to the number of, of students they have, it becomes very, very expensively. Those school districts that are much larger, just by you know, economy of scale, can, can do the same job much cheaper. I'm not saying reorganization or consolidate. That has to be a decision each board member, uh, each district has to make. One of the uh, discussions I'm sure you're hearing about when it comes to agriculture is the prairie chicken issue, from the greater to the lesser, and uh, it really caused quite a problem. And uh, folks will be looking for the governor to lead on this issue. Well, yeah, exactly right. I'm a constitutionalist first and foremost, and so we look at our constitution and see what we can do and what we can't do. And the Tenth Amendment is not a dead amendment. You know, I went to law school. They said the Tenth Amendment is dead. It's not dead. You know, that is our state sovereignty protection. The, the rights and duties given the federal government are limited in number and scope, and uh, the rest of them are given to the states. What we do with our chicken out here is our business. Has, the EPA has no uh, way to play that, uh, enforce those rules upon us, having us have offsets and buy offsets if we want to build a lean-to on to a barn or another grain elevator or grain bin. You know, so in, in this regard, uh, I'll give credit where credit's due. Mr. Brownback is actively defending that uh, in court. It should be, and we need to you know, pass some more protections. The uh, lesser prairie chicken is not a migratory bird, so I don't believe there's any federal control. And whatever costs to defend that suit, and however long it takes, that's money well spent because we have to protect our state sovereignty. Water, uh, the governor right now is working on a water plan or a water vision. Uh, others in the past have, and, and uh, obviously when you talk a lot of western Kansas especially, uh, water is one of those key issues. Yes, yeah, see, the governor and, and Mr. Uh, Davis, both advocate putting in more resources, more support uh, for this, this water issue. 
Well, that's lawyer double talk for taxing people more before we have a plan. Now, we have the 50-year water vision, which is just kind of a, uh, one of the possibilities of what we could do. But I advocate doing nothing at this point in terms of mandating uh, any kind of conservation or, or uh, eminent domaining senior water rights or vested water rights. We need to do nothing until we have a plan. You know, it's a five-state solution, Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, Texas, Oklahoma. We have to have a, an agreement with the other states to do the same thing because it makes no sense at all for us to pass a law that destroys our ag economy out in western Kansas if the, the other four states aren't going to do the same. So right now we don't have a plan, so right now I absolutely oppose taxing Kansas property owners to develop a plan that they don't even know what the elements of that plan is. Well, as we wrap this up, let's uh, talk about an issue that will have to be faced by the governor and our friends to the uh, west, what they've done with the, with the marijuana issue. Uh, we're seeing some concern for law enforcement uh, in, the, in the west. Let uh, me talk about that issue. Well, the marijuana, legalization of marijuana kind of comes in two parts. You have the medical use of marijuana and the recreation of marijuana. As a criminal defense attorney, I, I defend uh, so many clients. Cases. And it is a gateway. And I don't see any kind of legislation coming in Kansas that would ever legalize it for recreational use. The marijuana legislation has a lot of moving parts to it. And so we're not there yet, it's not an issue yet, but medical use marijuana is. We've had Senate Bill 9 in the Senate for several years now, it's never gotten a hearing. But this year, 2015, I believe it's going to get a hearing. Uh, they took a poll last fall, 70% of our senior citizens believe there should be an option for the doctor to prescribe it. So, uh, if a medical use of marijuana uh, built in across my desk, uh, I would sign that bill. Uh, because nobody, no state agency, no state law should get between me and my doctor. You know, if he prescribes and he's going to supervise it, then that ought to be an option. So, but uh, we're just not there yet for the recreation use. Let Colorado, let Washington, uh, Alaska, Oregon both have it on their uh, ballots for this November. Let's watch these, some of these other states. Let's cut the data and, and uh, let's see if, what kind of social problem is connected to the, the tremendous economic benefits that they're claiming. Uh, let's get years or two years worth of data for the jump in. All right, thanks a lot for your time. Good luck on the trail. Well, thank you very much for having me. If you want to check more out about me, go to www.keenforkansas.com or join us on Facebook. All our positions are listed. Uh, whatever issue that uh, means the most to you, I'm sure I've covered it in my list. So. Great. Thank All you. right. Key number, who is the Libertarian candidate for governor in Kansas, has uh, joined us. Uh, on the road in Manhattan for Ag View, I'm Ken Rogers.